Good afternoon, friends. I'd like to welcome you to What's in Tegan's Storage Locker. It's the show that dares to ask the question, just what is in my storage locker? The answer today, well, friend, the answer is always going to be comic books. I grab a pile of comic books from here, there, everywhere. You know, we sift through them, find what we can of interest. So, the first thing I would like to do today is direct you to the Patreon. Uh, if you like the show, if you like what I do, if you want to support it, uh, that's how you show your appreciation. If you like any of the videos I do for other platforms or any of the writing I do for other websites, uh, that's how you show your appreciation. So, we had so much fun with uh, the Batman 400 that we read last time that I was looking through the boxes and realized, hey, one good turn deserves another. I actually have a number of uh, Batman anniversary issues uh, from, the, from the 80s. Night, most of them were nice, thick, either square bound or, you know, really thick stapled uh, editions like we looked at on the last episode and like we looked at uh, on this episode. Issue 200 of Brave and the Bold has an extra long Dave Gibbons story in it with both the Earth One and the Earth Two Batman. That's great. I actually read that on the TikTok. I never hear anyone talking about that one. Uh, Dave Gibbons did a lot of work for the uh, American comic book market uh, before Watchmen. That doesn't necessarily get a lot of play. I mean, his, his Green Lantern is a really nicely drawn, terrible Green Lantern stories, but. I don't want to start talking about Hal Jordan. There's no reason to start talking about Hal Jordan this, this late at night. We're talking about Batman. So, I, like I say, I have a whole pile of, ba of Batman anniversary issues, because they certainly had a few of them. And uh, they're a nice thing to pick up. I think I picked up a, a few of these, uh, I don't know, around 10 years ago. I wasn't going to the comic book store very often, but I was in there one time and... So they just put out a big box of newly sorted books, and I think this was uh, in the pile, because these don't Batman anniversary editions. The reason you grab them is because other people want them as well. Um, you don't always see them in the boxes. If you go through the, uh, if you go through the box at a store, you know, 500, 600, they'll be missing, because, you know, those are a good one to pick out if you just want a, a big Batman comic book with a lot of, a lot of good artists in it. So, you know, it's one that more people might pick up. And just on the cover here, we have Joe Kubert's signature, Dick Giordano, Jim Aparo, Bob Smith, uh, Garcia Lopez, that's uh, Jose Luis Garcia Lopez, Simonson, Walt Simonson, Tom Yates. And, oh, so it's a gatefold here. That's cool. That's really cool. I like that. So, the cover tells us seven special stories by Walter Gibson, co-creator, no, not co-creator, creator of The Shadow, Jim Aparo, Mike W. Barr, Carrie Bates, Alan Brenner, Dick Giordano, Carmine Infantino, Joe Kubert, Paul Levitz, uh, J.L. Garcia Lopez, Walter Simons, Bob Smith, Len Wein, Tom Yates. Uh, so, it's very much the type of comic book that you would make in, what year was this, 81. So this is like five years before the one that we read on the last episode. And you can see, like, okay, this is, this is an all-star panel for the dawn of the 80s. Then it doesn't look like they poached any, uh, I don't think they poached any Marvel guys necessarily for this, like the other one. Simonson was still at DC at this time. He did a fair amount of DC work earlier in his career before he went to Marvel. So, or Detective Comics, 500th issue anniversary special. This has To Kill a Legend by Alan Brenner and Dick Giordano. This is actually considered a very fine Batman story. Uh, one of the better anniversary issue romps. Gets reprinted now and again. Uh, and I think they're, I no, maybe they're not. I don't think they're reprints. Uh, the Too Many Cooks Caper by Len Wein and Jim Aparo. Yeah, this is all new stuff, I think. Once Upon a Time by Len Wein and Walter Simonson. 
The Final Mystery of Edgar Allan Poe by Mark W. Barr and Jose Luis Garcia Lopez. Gray Face by Walter Gibson and Tom Yates. So there's a Batman story in here by the guy who created the shadow. Uh, the guy who created the shadow after it had already been a, a voice on the radio. I literally just read that the other day because we're reading the, the Howard Chaikin when I am speaking now. I am reading the Howard Chaikin Shadow series on the um, my TikTok channel for the reviews. And... It's not my favorite story. I, I kind of think I forgot that. <laughs> I hadn't read it in well over 20 years. Uh, the Strange Death of Dr. Ertl, Paul Levitz, and Joe Cooper. Uh, what Happens When a Batman Dies by Carrie Bates, Carmine Infantino, and Bob Smith. So that right there. $1.50? Yeah, I'll pay, I'll pay $1.50 for that. Uh... Paul Evitz is already editor of Detective Comics. Joe Orlando's still in the building, managing editor. Man, that's a splash page right there. Just look at that. Yeah, I think you can put Giordano in the same bucket as someone like uh, Klaus Janssen, who is a an excellent linker who, inker who also tries their hand at penciling quite a bit. Pencil, you know, quite a, quite a few many comic books. It has a distinctive style, sort of somewhere between the Adams and, and the Infantino, I'd say. I mean, you know, that makes sense chronologically. Oh, and there's, there's Phantom Stranger, who shows up every once in a while. Just the, when you want someone to be really annoying... He's there to hell. Uh, they actually tried to give the Phantom Stranger an origin uh, after the New 52. And I mentioned those because, well, on the one hand, they're kind of terrible comics to saddle the Phantom Stranger with a, a wife and a family, I think it was. But at the same time, they got jammed Matisse to do it. And so while it's not good, I don't think anyone could have sold that premise. He did probably the, the best he could with something that he had to have known. He had to have known that it was probably not a status quo that was going to last. But uh, he also wrote the Hal Jordan Spectre, so that was a, that's a familiar remit for him. I have a lot of respect for James Dimitis. He's, I realize in hindsight, he wrote a lot of my favorite stories. Might have done the same for you if you're anywhere near my age. Although he's still at it, he hasn't quit by any means. He's got a, he's had a few Spider-Man projects uh, of late. Not that much Batman. Not as much as you think. I actually think we read uh, a J.M. Dematisse Batman story in the early days of this channel did we read it was it a Two-Face I'm thinking of one of the movie specials they did I don't remember who drew it so he drew some or he, he wrote some but uh, I, I don't think he ever really just tucked in and had a, had a really long run nice looking comic book I'm not bothering to read the story it's just bad. I've, I've read it before, Batman. Although not in this issue. I've read it in reprints. But, you know, it, it's a great one. It's a great one. You know, from the stories of this era, you know, if you're going to have a Best of Batman compilation, it's going to be this. And uh, The Batman Nobody Knows was around here, too. People like that one. The Batman Nobody Knows is uh, sort of like... Uh, if you've ever read the story of the kid who collected Spider-Man, it's a short story. It's actually only half an issue, and it's one of the most famous Spider-Man stories of all time. It's nowhere near as heavy as that, but the Batman, nobody knows, is kind of in the same vein. I recommend it if you come across it in a... Uh, oh, yeah, and I remember it. Yeah, I remember. Um, was this, this was in the best Batman stories, I want to say. Uh, the... In the 80s, they did the, the series of thick paperbacks 
I think they started with the best Superman stories and then they moved on to Batman. They did another Batman volume. They did the Joker and then they did a number. They did, they did uh, team ups, golden age stories, fifties. Actually one of the finest compilations I have is a, th a thick hardcover um, best of the fifties in that same format. They put a lot of work into compiling them with a historical eye. And this story was in the Batman volume. And so it ends with, this was an alternate universe adventure where you have a, Batman's given the chance to save another Bruce Wayne so that there would be, there would never be a Batman. Or maybe there would be a Batman, but he'd be different. A Batman, you know, guided by different exigencies. That's, I'm trying to remember if they've done that, a more high profile version of that. I mean, you know, at this point, just about every different kind of version of Batman you can think of. Batman's dad, that Batman's dad stuck around, I have to admit, you know, if, if Batman's dad just like shows up again, anything's fair game. Bring Uncle Ben back. Have him be a disembodied head in a jar. Like, at this point, I guess anything goes. The Too Many Cooks caper. Len Wein and Jim Aparo. Oh, man. Tatiana Wood coloring. Worth pointing out. Look at this. He's getting his best Chester Gould with his inking here. Yeah, one of the one of the, the few mainstream artists who, who really seemed to use uh, Gould and I guess maybe Kniff uh, as a guiding star rather rather late in the Bronze Age cycle for that. But you, you know, you can see. He just knows so well how to frame action. You just don't I'm sorry, you just don't see that as often. You still do see it. And when you do see it, it's worth pointing out. There's a lot of different ways to draw a comic, don't get me wrong, but, uh, you know, just straight up. Telling a story and six panels like that. Guy lights a cigarette. You, see, you get to see this wonderful bit of body language with his hand. Like, we don't appreciate maybe how Jim Aparo could actually draw. Look at this hand. You don't draw hands like that unless you have sketchbooks full of hands like that, somewhere in a box in your attic. Man, look at that, look at that. So, and, and this coloring, this, this coloring is really interesting. And the real irony of it is that, you know, this was the very dawn of the 80s and you finally had some interesting colorists in the era. Uh, Tatiana Wood is right at the top of that list, but pretty soon, Lynn Varley and, you know, even Richmond Lewis are going to come along and be able to do interesting things in this limited palette using some, you know, more subtle distinction between shades, taking, you know, the time to put the work in. And the problem is, is that this is also around the time when the explosion of independent publishers um, really, I, that is what engaged the arms race over printing technologies was uh, throughout the 80s. You saw that became a, a selling point for subsequent independent outfits until finally the, the tendency met its... Uh, met its Zenith in Malibu, which was ultimately just swallowed by Marvel, who wanted a computer coloring department. Supposedly, that's not the only reason they bought Malibu, but that's always struck me as a big part of it. Just, you know, looking at the expenditure on the face of it. Oh, but anyway, we're just I'm getting ahead of myself here. Look at this. Look at this. Look at this. Oh, man. I can't say enough good things about Jim Aparo. He's my favorite Batman artist. I think he is just about the best Batman artist of all time. 
Although we're not seeing a lot of Batman here. I guess this is a Bruce Wayne. Maybe he's undercover as something else. I'm not reading any of the... Oh yeah, so it was a, a Batman story where it's just uh, Bruce Wayne, I guess. Oh no, oh, it's a Slam, Br Slam Bradley. Well, he looks just like Bruce Wayne. I would keep expecting him to turn into Batman, but I forgot. Uh, Len Wein and Walter Simonson, Once Upon a Time. Now, Simonson had already drawn a bit of Batman. He drew The Manhunter, which also ran in Detective Comics uh, and featured Batman for the, the final chapter. I'm going to do that on the Tech Talk one of these days. It's just I have to... I only want to do so many extra long comic books throughout the week because it does take a little bit more time to write the scripts for those. And my time, the, the middle day has been taken up by bloodlines, so, you know priorities. Man, look at that. It's only two pages long, but that's that's nice. I think Simonson was, was on to uh, Star Wars by now. He wrote, he did, I don't know if he did more than a year, year and a half, but it, you know, a fair, respectable chunk of Star Wars comics. And they're very nice looking Star Wars comics. He definitely knew how to draw, draw a comic book long before uh, he was drawing Thor. He only came to Thor after he really knew what he was doing, and it shows. Uh, so what is this one? This one is... Oh, The Final Mystery of Edgar Allan Poe by Mike Barr and Jose Luis Garcia Lopez. All right. Interesting. That's an interesting page. Wow, look at that. Oh, and it's the elongated man. There we go. Oh, so we're we're getting all the detectives. That's it. Okay, I'm sorry. I didn't. I guess I didn't get hep to the theme there. <sighs> they're not a Batman team ups. They're actually getting their own stories. So yeah, Garcia Lopez drawing elongated man, which you know, nothing wrong with the elongated man. People really like the elongated man. And his wife. And yeah. They made some poor decisions in that period of the company. I'm not going to sugarcoat it. And I think losing those characters in a way that was not easily remedied, that was a problem. Now, it's arguable, however, that... Uh, Blue Beetle, on the other hand, him dying did open up the, the space for uh, another character. There's no denying that, but there was they never tried to do Elongated Man 2. Yeah, that, they never even gave that, they gave that one a, a go. Uh, so this isn't a very long one. All right, the Batman encounters Greyface. Oh, so Walter Gibson, yeah. Walter Gibson died in the mid-80s, I think, because I, I, this is literally fresh in my head because the first issue of that Shadow miniseries had a text piece on the history of the Shadow. I knew the bare outline, but he was still alive in the 80s and still writing, supposedly up until his death. That's, that's how you want to go. Oh, man, look at these spot illustrations. I'm not reading this on the camera here. But just look at how this is designed. It's a really interesting-looking page. Wow. Wow. You know, maybe one of these evenings I'm going to crack this open and actually read the thing, but I'm not going to read it right now. But it's kind of cool. They got, they got Walter Gibson to do a real, legit, like, 10-page long... You know, Batman story. That's cool. Oh, and a Hawkman story with Adam uh, Adam Kubert lettering with Joe Kubert doing the art. Tatiana Wood on colors. Man. Hawkman. I uh, read a Hawkman book on the, the TikTok a, while, a little while ago because it was a Bloodlines chapter and 
I don't own very many comic books, any hot, very many Hawkman comic books. I think we've actually read one of the few Hawkman comic books I own on this channel. They kept trying to give him good creators is the thing. Because, you know, he's got this great pedigree, Joe Kubert. Yeah, but... I don't know. Maybe I need, yeah, I need to go back and read the Silver Age run all the way through. I've only read bits and pieces of it. I, I like Joe Kubert just fine. I just... Uh, something about when they get that guy in his own comic book. It's, it's just... I don't want to read about him. I can read about her. They actually did a Hawk Girl run. Not for the new... I don't think it was the New 52. No, I think before that, they, they gave it a go with a, a volume that had, like, Walter Simonson and Howard Chaikin. Can't remember if they were working together or separate. I think they were working together, I think. Don't quote me on that, and I don't feel like looking it up. But they, they both worked on the title, so that there was some acknowledgement that the version in the the, the Justice League cartoon had, had penetrated into consciousness. A popular consciousness. And, you know, I would much rather read a hot girl comic or a hot woman comic, whichever one you want to give us. Which, how was she credited here? Oh, they didn't credit her. They're just calling her Shay here. What happens when a Batman dies? This is, oh, this is the Carmine Infantino story. Oh, man. Carmine Infantino. He has, he does a great Batman. Carrie Bates writing. I don't know how much Carrie ba I don't know how much Batman Carrie Bates did. Instinct would tell me he probably wrote a fair amount at some point because he certainly did enough work for the Superman books, but that doesn't necessarily mean anything. Uh, it's not like there weren't other talent who uh, st stayed, you know, like Jim Aparo. He didn't draw Superman very often, usually only in Brave and the Bold. I went back a while ago and I read, I reread not uh, Carmine Infantino's first work on The Flash. I reread uh, a few years ago Carmine Infantino's later run in the 80s, which is a weird run because it's about Barry Allen on trial for his life. It's interesting. They're trying something new and different, but they're getting Mr. Silver Age to draw it. <laughs> So there is a little bit of disjuncture uh, in the approach there, but there's, you know, there is no, and there's no questioning the fact that he knows how to draw a great bat looking Batman comic book. Oh, and there's Dead Man. Uh, oh, so Batman's in a coma and he's sending an EEG through his brain functions. Oh my God, that's great. That's fantastic. That's how strong Batman's willpower is. He can send Morse code through an EEG when he's in a coma. It's like, get dead man. We need, we need help. Oh, so apparently dead man was already just like watching. Okay. Uh, oh, so he takes over Commissioner Gordon. He's like, oh yeah, no, it's, it's me. Dead Man seems like it should be a million dollar idea, and yet no one's ever tried it to a TV show. It's it's like a supernatural quantum leap. It's a slam dunk. And when they were making all those DC television shows, for a while there, that, that's kind of slowed here, but for a while it seemed like every time Nick and Harry was getting a TV show, they never even tried with Dead Man. And Dead Man seems like, like I say, really simple idea. I guess it's too simple for the brain geniuses in Hollywood. That's that is an interesting choice. Is this another Tatiana Wood joint? Adrian Roy, Adrian Roy. Yeah. Oh, well, you know, it's still an excellent looking color hold there, with the yellow on the the. The pulp, man, look at this. They just don't make them like this anymore, folks. I know, I sound old. I hope all the children are watching me and chuckling. 
because, you know, you have to keep the children entertained or no one will come visit you. Oh, look at this. Look at this. My God. Friends. This right here is a gorgeous comic book. So, I don't know what's going on. I'm not following what's going on because I'm not reading the story. It's a full-length story, though. Feels like. So, oh, man. Uh, wow. All right. That's a... That's a dog. That's like... <laughs> if the only dog you've ever seen was in the Bayou Tapestry. <laughs> I mean, it's great. But, man, he just does not, straight up, does not even vaguely know how to draw a dog. <laughs> I respect that. I respect that. Someone in the twilight of his career, like, he doesn't, if he doesn't want to draw a dog, he doesn't have to draw a dog. Uh, it's still gorgeous, though. The writers, artists, and staff of DC Comics thank you, our readers, for making this celebration possible. And here's a text, pay, text piece introducing you to who all the schmucks were who put this together. Man, that's a nice comic book right there. And now for something completely different. From one anniversary issue to another, uh, Detective 500 to Avengers 750. Uh, I think I only paid a couple bucks for this in a, in a box in some, one of the comic book stores uh, I went to a while ago. And I picked it up because it was a nice, chunky anniversary issue. And, you know, I love those. Uh, so this was a collage cover. Who did this? Oh, it's just going to list who they are. It's not going to tell you who actually did the collage and drew the Jarvis. It's a nice collage. They had a period where uh, they had a few collages that they were putting out. Uh, I can understand it's not something you do every day, but they were nice collages. Oh, oh well, that places this in time. Man, I think that's when people, in hindsight, as someone who hasn't seen any of the Marvel stuff since Endgame, just looking on from the outside in, uh, this is where the wheels really started to come off. And I am actually interested. I'm going to watch this someday because uh, it sounded interesting, even if I'm sure I don't like the umbrage it takes with the source material at the same time. Uh, I like the source material. I think it's underrated source material. Any attempt to do something with it is probably worth at least a a glance, because I've seen, I've seen divisive opinions on it, and for something in the Marvel movies to have even a divisive opinion is a strong divisive opinion is one of the better uh, outcomes you can hope for from that system. So this is a big, uh, it's not the end of Jason Aaron's long uh, Avengers run, but I think this is teeing up like the last uh, movement of that very long run. And I've still only read like the first two thirds of it because I read it on Marvel Unlimited years ago and I got caught up uh, to like the, the arc with the, the Phoenix tournament, which I have to admit was, was not my favorite arc, but I, I had every intention of following through on the series. I just haven't gone back. But I did pick this up, like I say, from one of the, one of the trips I took a while back. This is the type of thing. I would have loved when I was a kid. It's just little cover galleries like this that you stare at and learn all the, the history. So, like, a murderer's row on this book. Let's try to see if we can get through it. I'm guessing this first, was that uh, Carlos Pacheco, I'm guessing? I saw his name. Yeah, Carlos Pacheco. No, I know, like, that, <laughs> that eye for figure work. You know, in the tradition of people like Garcia Lopez. I still, you know, I don't like to think about what happened. He should have been with us for a lot longer. Kazar versus Kid Thanos. Oh, man, maybe the runners had too much nitrous. Kid Thanos? They let him do Kid Thanos. 
<laughs> it's not a good sign for Morty saying, well, they let him do this. Uh, a while back ago on the channel, I, I also, I read the Avengers 1 million special because I picked it up for a buck somewhere and it had Kev Walker art. It's a nice looking comic book. I recommend it on, on that, those grounds, but uh, the Avengers of 1 million BC, I, uh, I have some problem with the time frame. I like the, I, I actually do, I'm, o I'm okay with the idea, I can go with it. It's just that one million number is not what, that's not what they tell us humanity looked like one million years ago. It just, it is not. There were not redheads walking around a million years ago. There just weren't. There weren't. It has been a long time since I took anthropology. The first time I tried to go to college, I remember that part of it. So. Avengers 750. Now, I know that this run has come in for some brick bats of, of late. It's perhaps not the most well-regarded Avengers run, but uh, I kept with it because I found myself more forgiving of it than, uh, than I expected necessarily, even though it's not a perfect run. I felt that he was definitely trying to do something that was very much in, in the spirit of the, the classic iteration of the book, which was even though, you know, he had to use a number of characters who were, you know, pretty central to, you know, the Avengers franchise at the time, with meaning, you know, this has got Cap, this has got Thor, this has got Iron Man, as well as Black Panther, as well as Captain Marvel. This had She-Hulk for a while before she was in the spotlight. This sort of put her back uh, in people's attention, although they did not like what they did with her in this book. Eh, you know, it was a temporary thing. They had, I guess they had to do it at some point. Now they know it sucks and they're never going to do it again. But this uh, iteration of the book also saw the introduction of a number of new characters to the Avengers. Uh, this Ghost Rider, the Car Ghost Rider, uh, who everyone likes. Uh, I think I think they're fine with having multiple Ghost Riders going around the Marvel Universe. I think that that ship sailed the moment they just acknowledged that there are two Spider-Men. Uh, Gorilla Man, who I was really, really happy to see, was being uh, loaded up for a significant role in the book, and then I did not like what they did with him. After waiting years for anyone from the Agents of Atlas, really, to get any play. Hell, if they brought back Agents of Atlas, I would be there. I would be there on day one. I really liked Agents of Atlas. It was a great book. It just never took off. Never took off, and they tried. Oh, yeah, and they're still, this is still in the middle of what they're doing with She-Hulk. What is this? Is this this looks like, looks like an ad for something? Area Twenty One or oh, it's a record. It's a music ad. Well, goddamn, good for them getting some ad pages. Man, they just they need more ads. The problem isn't going to get any better. They're not going to be able to put it at a price point that's going to make people want to buy this, unless they can amortize the cost with sufficient ads, and unless they put more ads on it, they're never going to be able to get it back into retail stores that aren't the direct market. It's... Uh, they were, you know, and he took a lot of liberties with... Hello, you're back again. He took a lot of liberties with the Celestial, and I don't really, really, I really don't care for what he did uh, in terms of the retconning the Celestials. Uh, is this David Baldion? Uh, I saw his name. Yeah, Avengers Mountain. Oh, yeah, so I guess there were only like six artists for that first, I guess. I don't know. This is a thick issue, but it, I'm not making sense of this credits. Maybe they, maybe it comes back to it. It's nice looking. I'm lost as to where this is specifically in the story. But that was another saving grace of the Aaron run, as they gave him A-list art talent from the beginning to the end. So, and, and a, lot of, a lot to do with Russia. I like that he was also, oh, and there we are. What was I just saying? People were sick of that, so there we are. One of many times she has appeared almost naked in a comic book. Uh, and this was, I think, before this was like 2001, was this? 
But yeah, January 2021, so that's January 2022. So that means this can't, comes out at the end of 21. So the, the She-Hulk series is, I think, still in the future. Man. I know some people liked it, but the, the buzz on it was just not... Not what I would have hoped. Maybe I'll maybe I'll get around to it one of these days if I have all the time in the world and nothing else to do with it. <laughs> so there's Kid Thanos fighting the Avengers of One Million BC. It's a nice looking comic book. Oh, and here's a Doctor Doom. And Mephisto. Mephisto was a big part of it too. See, I mean you can't say that he wasn't hitting for the stands trying to create something big. And, you know, maybe as far as that goes, it feels almost like a, like a run that was seven or eight years too late to really capitalize on, on that kind of high concept move. Although, you know, once they start to get to the end here and it's just row upon row of, like just everybody shows up. You, you flip through the, the issues in the later part of the run, which is all I've done so far is flip through them in the store. And they just, they're filled with hundreds of different characters. I'm, I'm actually looking forward to catching up on it just to seeing, just to see how, what story goes with the, the weird bits that I scanned in the store. It doesn't necessarily mean it's good. And he introduced Blade to the Avengers, which... You know, I don't. I don't hate the Blade is in the Avengers. I just hate everything they've done with Dracula since Cornell's. Uh, M, was it M thirteen that they did the the big Dracula storyline, and that was the big Dra last big Dracula storyline before they did the uh, the new look. Do not get me started on that new look Dracula. It's. Uh, you know, the problem with that is I, I know exactly why they did it. They explained their reasoning, and it makes sense on the face of it. Of course, they want their Dracula to be different. They want their Dracula to look like, you know, a Marvel character. The problem is, is that then he doesn't look like Dracula. The whole point, the cool part, was that in an era where vampires were could be any anything, you still had that one guy in the back who... who held up the classic shtick and then they just thought people were tired of the classic sh shtick and now you look back and realize well, no one's doing the classic shtick anymore uh, Image just the other month did a the Skybound sub imprint uh, Kirkman's label they did a uh, adaptation of Dracula not Stoker's Dracula but the Universal Studios Dracula and I picked that up because it looked like a breath of fresh air. I'm so used, I'm, I'm so unfazed by most vampires, but I'll still get out of bed for someone who does a classic, you know, Dracula. And Marvel has that in the palm of their hand and they dress the dude up like, are we back to um, McGinnis again? McGinnis is here. Yeah, McGinnis. I like McGinnis' style. I like McGinnis' style since he first started getting work in the uh, late 90s. And he's evolved a much cleaner style. I wonder if he's doing digital. I wonder if he's doing digital now. Because it feels cleaner. I was just saying, wasn't I? I liked that they used Ursa Major, but uh, he, he was a real SOB. So I guess he's just hanging out in Wakanda with, with a grizzly bear who's probably really, really happy to, to be uh, in a savanna climate. Because <laughs> I'm looking, they got, they got elephants, and, and even gorillas aren't, the, they live in the mountains. Grizzly bears don't like the heat. Poor grizzly bear. Bullpen bulletins with... Three different spotlights. Danny Kazem, assistant editor. Annalise Bissa, associate editor. Uh, Alana Smith, associate editor. And then uh, C.B. Sobolski, 
paragraph there. Well, that's cool. I just, it, I have trouble. It bounces off my eyes with the digital presentation. What they need to do is they need to do an old paste up again. Because that is, when, when you actually take a scan of a paste up, it looks so much easy, easier on the eyes. I'm, I'm sorry, I'll die on that hill. That's like the oldest thing I've ever said. I acknowledge that. Oh, is this? Oh, Howard Stark. Yeah, well, they, what was I just saying earlier? They got Batman's dad, and Howard Stark has done a lot too. And you know, to be fair, I mean, they got the guy from Mad Men to play Howard Stark, so it was obvious that, that people would want to do more with the character. I loved the, the, the Karen Gillan run where they revealed that Tony Stark had a brother. Oh, there's our dude. How you doing? Well, Kazar versus Galactus. Who you got on that one? Well, I don't know if it's anything like the Kazar series from the 90s. You know, we'll probably see Kazar, you know, out brawl Galactus here. Well, he's literally going to jump onto Galactus with a knife, so. <laughs> Good job, Lord Plunder. You make excellent choices. You married above your station. Don't forget that. Uh, so, Dr. Doom's still doing something or other. And that's, I want to say that's Aaron Cooter, is that? Yeah, Aaron Cooter. He, got, he did a lot of weird-looking Avengers work for the later part of the Aaron run, and I like his style. Uh, it, it is a very interesting, very distinctive style. I'll, I'll pick up a comic and look through it if he drew it. So there's a... Is that a Hydra King in Black? Uh, like a Phoenix Destroyer? Is that what that is? It's kind of what that looks like. Well, that looks like a Phoenix, too. Uh, the Age of the Masters of Evil. There's Submariner when he was wearing this armor. Is he? He's not still wearing the armor, is he? This armor? And I'll just go back to the green trunks. Like putting him half in clothes, just it, it just seems useless. He walks around with a speedo on, and that's all he needs. Is that uh, the Jane Foster? Yeah, Jane Foster. Who is the going by Valkyrie now? Uh, I don't know. I'm not up on Thor. I don't know what the last thing they did with the the Barbara Norris. I don't even know if it's still the Barbara Norris Valkyrie who was the Valkyrie who showed up again in the in the uh, the Defenders revival that was all women in the. Don't ask me to remember. It all sort of blends into a big gray mush after a while. <laughs> so it's Deathlock and Ghost Rider just want, driving across Earth 818. Oh, and this this was a I, I mean to go back and and, walk, and do this one. Uh, this came out right before I, I really started going back to the comic book store every week. But this is a book that everyone said nice things about, and it apparently sort of served up a lot of the stuff that he was going to do in, uh, with his Avengers stuff, from what I understand. What I peeked in at that. Uh, so, yeah, this is a nice-looking comic book. You can't say this isn't a nice-looking comic book. So Doom's amassed all these reprobates. Someone's feeling themselves. Killmonger? That, that's Killmonger in the, the Phoenix Destroyer costume? I guess. Wastelanders. That's a striking piece of art. Didn't they, um... Now, this is an ad for... for a, I, guess, I think this is a line of one-shots. But I want to say that this was a tie-in to a line of audiobooks they were doing. I want to say. Uh, audiobooks or audio adventures... 
that's something that made a comeback. Yeah, everything all is new again. Oh, yeah, in the 21st century, people are going to be listening to, like, you know, audio adventures. You mean like the BBC always did? Yeah, the, what are they called? I can't remember the company. Big Finish. Big Finish. There is an endless stream of Doctor Who ancillary audio media. That was obviously a market for it. Now, this, this series, this only lasted six issues. Uh, another Jason Aaron series. But he's not the reason to find this. This is Mahmoud Azrar. And this is some of the best work I've ever seen him from him. If you see this series, pick it up for that reason. He's, he's pretty good. He was really good on this. Jason Aaron returns to his Conan magnum opus. Oh, so I guess, see, I have it. I guess I didn't realize it was, I, could, I missed the first part of the, the Conan at Marvel. Only caught the tail end of it because I like the Savage Avengers books as well. Man, the orb always just get, takes it in the shorts in Jason Aaron comics. Although, to be fair, if it weren't for Jason Aaron, literally no one would use the orb. That's that's nice. That that is a very nice looking page right there. I'm finally doing it, mother. What you always wanted. I'm finally dying. <laughs> okay, that's funny. Chapter nine. The orb is dead. Many more will follow. Back to Kazar. Oh, so Kazar becomes the. Is this happening in an alternate universe? <laughs> I guess I need to read the story. Oh, that's nice. You get a... Uh, what in a previous generation would be uh, Elliot R. Brown doing a uh, schematic... Uh, oh, that's upside down. On the Devil's Reign event, which, you know, worse ideas for a superhero story than the Kingpin becomes mayor. And is this, oh, that looks like Steve McNiven. Steve McNiven, as I live and breathe, my goodness. You can't go wrong with Steve McNiven. Now, uh, Steve McNiven has drawn some very dodgy comic books. But they weren't dodgy. Oh, wow. Okay. That, that pulls you in. That pulls you in. I don't usually care for those guys because they can get kind of repetitive. But that, that's a nice reveal there. <laughs> yeah, they're not, they're not doing much against me all near, are they? Oh, man. Look at this, though. Fully taking advantage of, you know, what the, what the computer coloring can do there. Do, do not get me wrong. You know, they can do very, very nice things with computers. I just enjoy watching the limitations at work, but, you know, that's just me. This is, this is very nice looking as well. That is an excellent looking Thor. I mean, hell, you know, Civil War is a terrible story. Well, you know, it's worth flipping through because it, it looks nice. There are a number of really nice looking passages in it if you just tr try to avoid reading what's happening in the little bubbles. <laughs> yeah, the, the brood, they're not, they, they, they don't have a lot <laughs> that, that Thor needs to worry about. <laughs> now, you know, if you ever corner Tom Brevoort about it, he will swear up and down, Thor is not bulletproof. And to be true, to be fair, he, he is 100% right on the issue, but that has not been dealt with consistently. If you go back and look at the handbooks, it says, as guardians, I think it's, there's, their tissue is three times as dense. Meaning, yeah, he probably can shrug off like small arms fire. Maybe uh, he can, uh, Maybe it'll go, it'll be a flesh wound. But for the most part, it doesn't necessarily come up, although you see sometimes, like, oh, he's crushed by a building. You kind of need to be bulletproof not to die, not to be shredded 
if nothing else, when, when that happens. But you have to, you know, I guess suspend disbelief. Oh, so this, what's your name, lad? Arthur. Okay. All right. <laughs> Okay, whatever. <laughs> We're just going to move on. Spinning out of the cataclysmic events of Avengers 750, the next great Avengers saga begins here. Sent by the mysterious Avenger Prime from a great watchtower at the dark heat of all, all that is, dark heart of all that is, the cybernetic soldiers known as the Deathlocks have come to our Earth with a dire warning for the Avengers. But to ensure the Deathlock's warning of megaversal doom is never delivered, hunters follow closely behind them, the most earth-shatteringly powerful hunters any universe has ever seen. And their first stop, the Golden Realm of Asgard. All right. And here's the Avengers Forever book that was a spinoff that ran, I believe, through the last year of, like I say, the, the last major storyline on the book. And it's just filled with all sorts of... Uh, other Avengers and alternate Avengers and just everything you can imagine. And we're, we're back, and we see just a few ad buys this, this issue. There was that, uh, oh, I guess that issue of Batman didn't have any ads in it. Because this one, it had the uh, music ad, Eminem's ad, and a, a watch ad. And since this is for Disney product, I, I wonder how much they, they even got for that one. Like I say, they need the video games and they need the Warhammer to put big, expensive advertising supplements in the middle of their comic books. And then they can get the kids. All right. We pandered with some Batman and some Avengers. How about we look at something that I'm pretty sure uh, you've probably never heard of before because this is not a... I don't think this has ever been reprinted. I don't think. Uh, Ken Stacy, he's a name who uh, was really prominent in the 80s. Um, I think he just got to start doing regular art, but he was someone who uh, really moved into the space uh, in the late 80s that was opened by the, by the embrace of uh, better printing technology and better coloring. Uh, he had this, I, I want to say, I don't know if it was all airbrushed, but uh, it looks, it has an airbrushed look. It, it has to be airbrushed. That has to be what that is. Uh, he did a number of issues of Marvel fanfare in this style, Iron Man stories that look very good, very stylish, very interesting. This is close to a, you know, commercial style for the late 80s. And this is a, a this is copyright Ken Stacy. So this is a creator-owned thing, apparently, but... Um, I dedicate this section to my father, Lieutenant Colonel C.W. Stacy, retired pilot RCAF CAF, per Ardua at Astra. So it's about aviation. Ken Stacy, writer and artist. Andrew Pratt, letterer, Art Young, associate editor. Karen Berger, editor. There you go. And that's uh, 1990 that came out. And, you know, that's, that's when Karen Berger was putting together the portfolio of books that were, were going to be uh, at Vertigo. And, you know, maybe this isn't, maybe this is, okay, this is a bit of a sci-fi story, I guess. Not quite would have, what would have ended up at uh, Vertigo, at least in the early days, in terms of tone. But this is the type of project that uh, she knew how to spearhead, you know, artist project. That maybe, you know, doesn't have the biggest commercial profile, but if you put it in the right context, you know, maybe it'll find an audience. Because look at this. This is this is very nice. This looks like, like I say, state-of-the-art 1980s commercial art. And that is an interesting effect on uh, the comics page. Oh, so the guy flying a... Oh, he's flying a fancy ship. Uh, someone, thanks, kid. I needed that. I'm not going to try to follow what's going on here. Uh, so he cra that guy crashed, but he apparently was able to jump in time, and he's getting balled out by a superior here. 
I thought I saw a second blip on my scope, but I lost it the next moment in all the confusion. Ooh, look at that. That's nice. Pretty decent, you know, draftsmanship underneath the, the color work. But yeah, I mean, this looks like a rough draft of what people were really going to start doing, you know, in the early days of uh, computer coloring. But this is this is not a, a computer. No one was using, no one was doing this digitally at the time. This is this is manual. Now, of course, in a few years, when like I say, you know, computer coloring really starts to take off. The the Malibu books, the the early Ultraverse stuff, with the computer coloring, garish. Maybe hasn't held up so well. If they ever did reprint it, I don't know if they might want to recolor it, as famous as the coloring was at the time. But you can definitely see. I mean, this is uh, in the direction of what, you know, someone like Sinkovich really opened up that space uh, for people to do. You know, it's not like Sinkovich did the first painted comic. I don't want to try, try to tell you that he did. But uh, the work that he did at Marvel, I, I don't think we can really uh, underestimate just how influential that was before he even picked up a paintbrush. And then when he picked up a paintbrush, well, it was all over. You know, people saw Electra Assassin, and you know, that, that book, I think, was as big for artists as anything else Miller did. even if maybe the, the influence is a little bit uh, harder to suss because uh, Sinkovich is just such an all-encompassing talent. But man, look at how nice this looks. I have no idea what's going on. It's just a series of random images passing in front of me. Now, the thing is, I would very much like to have this on the, the TikTok channel at some point, this series, but I don't have the, the second issue. Uh, I need to find the second issue, and then I'll probably read it on the TikTok. Because, I mean, it's very nice, and it's not something that I think I've ever seen anyone mention before. You know, DC was putting out a number of uh, sci-fi uh, comics at the time, a number of, you know, sci-fi adaptations. They had a whole line of, of really nice sci-fi graphic novels. They had top-shelf artists doing adaptations of pretty famous sci-fi stories. I don't think any of it's in print. They could do. I don't know if they could do a big... Omnibus, actually, because it's all different stories belonging to different uh, art, different artists and different artist estates. But um, if they wanted to put that stuff out again, it's a bunch of really nice material that hasn't been seen in decades. Man, look at that. This is interesting. You have to admit, you don't see something like this every day. I don't know if it would work for every comic, but this is perfect for a comic book about uh, fancy aircraft and, and flying around in airplanes. This is the perfect style for this. It's kind of your, you know, this approach to, to storytelling it was as a European air. He, I, I don't know if he was ever in heavy metal, but with this approach, he almost could have been. This is like something you, you could have found in like mid-run heavy metal. And you can tell it's someone who really understands how color works, because it pops. He knows how to use contrasting colors. He knows, uh, he knows how to use color as a primary element in composition, which isn't something you see necessarily in comics a lot, because the colors aren't that often put down by the person who draws the story. Now, a good colorist especially like in superhero comics where everyone's wearing different colored clothes, a good colorist can still see how to make the color work for them. But there's no substitute for just sitting there with the colors and building your compositions around that expression of color, which is what, you know, Stacy's doing here, really. Oh, man, just look at it. Because this would be, this would read fine if this were pen and ink, it's not just nice because the colors are, are rad. The colors are really rad. 
but it works because he has enough of a basic understanding of what he's doing that he can attempt a fairly uh, a fairly ambitious story drawing wise considering it's filled with military equipment soldiers in uniforms planes uh, dog fights you know I mean, they have done a lot of enemy ace stories but it's a difficult thing to draw a dog fight in the air you know that's why you, you get people like toth to do it or joe kubert and this is a perfectly perfectly fine dog fight man look at this this is just and like i say when i find the second issue of this and i actually put it on the show I'll read it and I'll sit down and see. You know, it looks like a, you know, a sci-fi pot boiler, maybe some time travel, dealing with the military. Yeah, looks like it might be fun, but it looks nice. It looks really nice. Ooh, look at that. And, you know, this doesn't look that far off from what the very early uh, Alex Ross was doing. Go back and look at the very first Alex Ross story that he did for o the Open Space Anthology. The Wizard printed years later. I put it up on the TikTok. Uh, maybe like last year at some point. First Alex Ross. And then he did a Terminator series. And then he came back and did Hellraiser for Marvel. He did not like doing Hellraiser, but uh, Clive Barker got him the job. It's a very fascinating story. And you know, you look at what he was doing there and, and his early work uh, was, was definitely in this, in this vein. Like I say, people who had really, I think, had their, their brains open wide by seeing what the sink did on Electra Assassin. Author, illustrator, Ken Stacey was a Canadian Air Force brat whose pet obsession is aviation. Next to flying, he likes to write and draw comics best. His favorite color is ultramarine violet. He's very happily married to artist Joan Thornborough Stacy. And they have two terrific kids, Alex and Ray. Well, there you go. How can you hate a comic by a guy who, who likes airplanes? There you go. Looks, I mean, it's a nice looking comic. All right, so we only got through three, but they were all big, big boys. Uh, so check out the Patreon, like I say. Uh, do all the normal things that that you feel called upon to do, such as liking and subscribing and tell everyone you know, tell every single person you know to watch. Uh, check out the Patreon. There's tons of stuff to download on there. If you like what I do, that's how you show your appreciation. Check out my daily reviews. They're on both TikTok and Instagram. Uh, same reviews posted up. What else? I got a podcast with Claire Napier. It's called Utter Madness. We talk about Top Cow Comics. That's Witchblade, The Darkness, Mark Silvestri, Michael Turner, all that good stuff. Everything in between. Uh, we're on Patreon ourselves. Uh, we're on Spotify. We're even on YouTube for a few videos. And SoundCloud as well. What else? Uh, you know, I have things most weeks on the Comics Journal's website. Uh, I've been bi-weekly lately. I'm just, you know, kind of taking a break. I did weekly for most of last year. And I thought that was, I was pretty chuffed about doing that. So I can, you know, maybe take the foot off the gas a little bit here for the new year. All right. Just please be well. Take care of yourself take care of this world. We all need to treat each other better. Be kind, especially to small children and animals. Do well and be well, and I will catch you all on the flip side.